Um, so I'm going to talk about pesticides, the Great Barrier Reef region, what's, what we find, what the risk is in different parts of the GBR and what the management response is. A lot of it's out of a paper we're writing for a moment for a special issue of the journal that Eric you with the front the special editor for. Um, and so some of it, what's here is due to Matt Landos, who's a vet that works in this area as well, a vet that works in agriculture, because prawn farms, barramundi farms and more. Um, it's very wordy, as I said, but anyway, here's what we're going to say. It's pretty simple. We find pesticides everywhere we look in waterways, from fresh water to the far outer reef, and as far north as Cape York, as you want to go. And place I've never seen <coughs> pesticides yet because we haven't looked properly is in the Torres, northern Torres Strait. We need to do that. So we still find them, unfortunately. And they come from Australia, not from Papua New Guinea. Um, we find them in above all sorts of trigger values that have been set. Um, they're mostly from agriculture, pickled sugar. I'll show you why in a minute. Um, obviously, the risk is closest and highest where the agriculture is, that's fresh water. And it declines as you go offshore to the power shelf reefs. Um, management, of course, is about the federal government and the state governments, particularly APVMA we'll talk about, and we're not doing very well, so this isn't a good story, you know, I'm tell. Lots of you have been to my talks before, there aren't many good stories, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So, um, lots of pesticides are used in agriculture and they're lost and we can find them. We, this is a hugely data rich environment. We've got lots of information, um, much more than any else in Australia by far in a way. And that's because of the GBR, basically. Um, we get lots of money for research and monitoring compared to anything else you might think of. That's for everything, as you know. Um, we're concerned about herbicides, um, particularly, but we'll talk about insecticides as well. Um, you find them particularly in the lagoon after flood events, um, and insecticides, particularly imidacloprid, I'm going to talk about, which is one of these insecticides, imidacloprid, um, we find in regularly above right lines in lots and lots of waterways. It's a very controversial set of um, insecticides banned in the EU, banned in the US again just a couple of weeks ago. They went up and down. Trump, Trump released the ban, but now through a court case it's been imposed again in the US. But you think it's going to be banned in Australia? Or shake your head because of that. I should. <laughs> Um, why have we got a pesticide problem? Well, you can't see the colours that well, but it's because of right along the coast from Mossman, which is there somewhere, down to here, which is Coffs Harbour, we have coastal cotton. Particularly sugar cane, it's the red stuff, it's sort of hard to see so you, but it goes all the way down there. There's breaks around Townsville with Vertican, bit of a break here, all the Mackay with Sunday. Another break here and then down in the Burnett Bay area, and then of course down in all New South Wales as well. You also have water horticulture, bananas and other horticulture all right on the coast. And if you drive from Mossman to Coffs Harbour one day on the highway, you'll begin cropping just about all the way. That's pretty unique in Australia. They're not coastal cropping anywhere else, it's inland further. Grain cropping, cotton, mm -hmm. not far inland, but our cropping's right on the coast. Um, so, what I'm going to do is go through the different sorts of water bodies, starting those closest to the agriculture, freshwater wetlands, and I'm going to use examples and then give what I think the risk of these are to that particular sort of water body. I'm going to use Sandy Creek here for the freshwater one, just south of Mackay, there's Mackay. You drive over it if you drive south of Mackay, and, and it drains essentially sugarcane. Um, you find diorong, the main herbicide, still used in sugarcane, although it is, has been not banned but restricted in use of it, and it's not having a slight effect, but I'll talk about that. But we find diorong, you find it all the way through here, 
and generally above the tree values. We find others, these are all herbicides as well, there's above ecosystem trigger values, read which you can't read insecticide, that's not going to work, but anyway, uh, that's the only insecticide among all this lot. We find it generally used in sugar cane as well, a whole range of other ones and a whole range of other ones. So, huge range of different pesticides, particularly herbicides. No fungicides here, but there are some issues with fungicides and redenticides as well as the rats. Uh, risk assessment in the, these freshwater regions of the coastal catchments is high. And there's lots of paper, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the papers which you can ask me about if you want. Uh, Estuarine wetlands, Barata Creek just south of Townsville. This is the Ramsar site, that green hatch colour. Um, and here's Barata Creek runs through here, all these orange colours is sugarcane. There's other cropping there as well, most of sugarcane. You can find in Barana Creek if you look, if you went there today and did some sampling, but over multiple years, 43 different pesticides you can find there today in Barana Creek. That's because today Barana Creek's made up of completely of irrigation total water. There's no natural rainfall on it, rain for a while. And so this tail water off the runs off the sugar cane is full of lots of stuff, including pesticides. They exceed trigger values all over the place for these herbicides, um, and this just confirms lots and lots of studies we've done down there. Um, and there's lots of studies like this for all over the place, up at Tully, up the Herbert, north of here and down the Mary River, at the far end of the GBR. Um, the risk assessment here is moderate because they are slightly lower concentrations than you find in the freshwater part here compared to the estuarine part here. Uh, let's go offshore a bit further. Now I'm in coastal waters and these are the waters that sort of contain coastal seagrass meadows. We have lots of data on that as well. And we see lots of Photosystem 2 herbicides, PS2 herbicides, you'll see me use that term again. I'm not, you can ask me what that means, but it's just ones that affect Photosystem 2 in plants. Um, we find lots of diuron again, and others that equivalent to diuron, so we can make it like a, a total diuron equivalent. Um, and we find others as well, tebuthyron, met metolachlor, um, exceeding even here, Water quality guidelines, risk assessment low to moderate, but remember even in this coastal waters here we've got herbicides that above guideline levels regularly, particularly after discharge events from rivers, but a lot of the time. Um, now we're going offshore a little bit further to where the inner shelf coral reefs are. Uh, wet tropics, we're finding substantial, and not huge concentration, but some concentrations of mainly herbicides again offshore and Kennedy showed you can find even on Cape York up here um, this is from a different thing but even up here you can find some low concentrations of herbicides down to large ones once you're down here and we're developing better in indexes now um, that take into account um, a range of pesticides, not just one at a time, and uh, they're being put in. So these are sort of um, positive things, actually, a lot of work going into making up good risk indexes that take account of all the pesticides present, not just one or two. So there's still some risk here, but it's getting it low and moderate. <laughs> now we're to the mid and outer shelf open waters, mid shelf reefs. Um, so we can still find pesticides easily any any time of the year at Wild Isles, Pixie Reef, which is sort of north of Cairns, the Midshore of Green Island, the Howicks, which are up near Wizard Island, um, usually in low concentrations. And uh, the latest, some of the latest work we've done um, is that we find these, but I, don't know, I can't even read that, I'm sorry. Um, we're assuming at the moment, because they're lower than the guidelines, they're at no risk. 
Um, I'll talk about that in a minute, what I think about that assumption and what we can do about it that we've out there. So if you go out to Pixie Reef, which is sort of on the mid shelf south of Agincourt, some of you will know, you can find pesticides at low concentrations every day of the year and a range of them as well. Is that doing anything? Well, at the moment, we should know. Anyway. Um, I'd also just like to mention it's not just pesticides. Um, <coughs> and this is from a turtle study we were involved in, green turtles. And the three study sites from the Howicks again, way offshore, Cleveland Bay and Upstart Bay. We find pharmaceuticals in coastal waters, vitamin B3, paracetamol, aloe purinols, the gout medication. Probably not what you mean, you're old enough to have gout yet, there you go. Codeine, you know what that is, and trifles answer, and just you wash your hands, and just thing. When you go to the hospital, maybe you should wash your hands. And so I think they're stopping it now because I think it might have some human health. You find them in green turtle and blood as well. This the out medication, this is the medication for skin conditions, cell cell acid that will come from asthma. Um, breakdown product and heart failure medications you can find way offshore. <laughs> um, in green turtle blood, not just in the water, and in sediments. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the studies show that you find more of them inshore, less of them offshore, not surprisingly. Um, the effect of all these things on green turtles that we've for a long time. Can't be good. We know it's not good, but what the long-term effect on turtle health is is hard to study. Really, and remember, turtles are difficult animals to study. They're not like the little fish lots of you people study, um, where you can go and collect them and without any ethics approval, torture them in a the tank. If we want to study green turtles, the chances of us going out and catching hundreds so we have good replications, sitting them in a tank and loading them up with. How they pure and all is zero. So this makes it difficult. You can't do those sorts of tests easily. Um, so let's talk about management. So the federal government regulates this wonderful body, the APVMA. You remember, some of you remember the story. It's the one that got shifted by Barnaby Joyce to Armadale. And because nothing was prepared properly, they ended up working out at McDonald's. Um, that's still going on. Most of them have moved from Canberra. Now Barnaby's not in that agriculture portfolio. I don't know what's going to happen to them, but I think something will still be here. I think the idea of moving them out of Canberra to other places is not totally silly. It's just that this was just up as an election. A, this is his own electorate, by the way. Um, which he won again in the election. Um, and this is a useless organisation, so nobody's you can learn my people have told me this before. And I'll put my opinion, Paul Regulator, industry capture basically does what the industry wants, agricultural industry, the pesticide industry want. Environment protection it has public health role as well. Does that better? Drinking water. As far as environmental protection goes, they're hopeless. Uh, they're very slow. Um, I'll show you in a mo moment about <coughs> re looking at old pesticides that were registered decades ago and never went through any proper assessment ever. Um, and if they use terrible models. They use models, the European catchment models, that don't, don't deal with clay soils. Well, we have a few clay soils in Australia, and the GBR has. They don't make a high rainfall events 50 millimetres in rain. Well, if you go to town one day, you'll be there when you have 500 millimetres in towns. So these are entirely inappropriate models to use, um, and that's what they're still using. Even though CSIRO and universities here have developed appropriate models for our conditions, they people they will not use. Um, slow chemical reviews is a while ago, I haven't updated it properly. You can see the length of time some of these um, have been under review. Chlorpyrifos was under review so long that now it's replaced by imidacloprid anyway, probably doesn't matter anymore. Um, and these hardly ever come to any resolution and there's no 
action on them either. You won't even see, I just might mention for one second glyphosate, which you'll see in the news, you don't see glyphosate there. What do I think about glyphosate? Well, I think the court's deciding whether it's a safe chemical or not is a disaster, I'm sorry. Um, it might be, it might not be too. And it's comparative. Unless you're going to go for modern pesticide agriculture, which I don't think we're going to, I still think glyphosate's um, better than some of the alternatives. Um, right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about imidacloprid and other neonicotinoids. Um, it's, they're banned in Europe uh, because of effects on bees. And they're foliar spray in Europe on top onto the tops of plants, and so that's where the bee gets access to it. Um, US, e, sorry, that will the US, USA follow? Yes, they did. But then last year Trump overturned that ban. But just recently, after a court case brought by some US environment body, the ban's been put in place again in the US as well. I'll just say that we find in the cloak and all over the place, in the GBR and in other places as well. What's the chances of Australian ban? Well, zero. Forget it. <laughs> Won't happen. Every country in the world banned it, maybe Australia would then. Like um, endosulfan, the last country in the world to ban endosulfan, the organochlorine pesticide. Um, now, this is full of words, so I'm not going to talk about it, but this, um, I'm just going to point out this huge number of flaws in the way APVMA registered chemicals. I'm only going to talk about a couple, so I don't want you to read all that. So let's just talk about a couple endocrine effects that are interesting. And uh, people with AIMS like Federica Kroon and Syro, Sharon Hook, been studying the effect of looking at catchments on Cape York compared to catchments down here and looking at Barramundi in particular and noticing effects down here that are obviously to do with endocrine disruption, which they blame on a swag of chemicals, including pesticides, particularly atrazine, which we have lots of. Um, endocrine effects are not part of the registration process at all. We'll look at them. Um, we don't look at the additive effects of chemicals, right? the re federal register. As I said, you can find 43 different residues it's okay to say what diet it might be doing, but what are the 43 doing together? Well, that's not part of the registration process at all. And it affects, but the Queensland government's doing some nice stuff now, looking at indexes of multi pesticide risk that I shared before. So there is stuff going on. The only problem is APV may just listen to the Queensland government either. Um, Right, there's another whole set of things. I'm just going to look at a couple. Um, we've got lots of data. It comes from well, people like me and my colleagues at Trump Water, Queensland Government, CSIRO, with huge amounts of pesticide data. Um, but APV may not really use any of it. And um, when we see elevated concentrations, which we do all the time, nothing ever happens at that federal level. Um, the other important point is that, you know, the impacts of pesticide um, are not borne by the farmer or the chemical company that uses. They're borne by the environment, which we're interested in, and also fishing industry, public health. So in a sense, keep thinking we're paying for the use, farmers' use of these pesticides, not the farmer, not in that bigger sense of the world. Will it? Um, Queensland Government, I'll say some nice things about it. Um, and they do this with financial support from the Federal Department of Environment and Energy, which is quite separate from APB. They don't have anything to do with each other, really, which is interesting. Monitoring new guidelines, report cards, mm -hmm. research into better application, and we do lots of modelling too. But um, the big monitoring programs are at the end of catchment sites, the end of rivers and out in the marine environment. And these are long-term monitoring that's been going on for years all over the GBR, not so much on Cape York. Um, and that's going on and we report on this, I'll show you in a moment. Um, they're developing new better trigger values and risk indexes 
Rachel Smith and Company from the Queensland Government. Um, as I said, some of the older indexes we use were just based on the herbicides where we equated them to diuron. But now we've got these multi-substance potentially affected fraction, MSPAF, tries to take into account all the pesticides in one place against a whole range of organisms, standard organisms from plants to animals and get a, if you like, a risk index that tells you something about what the effect on the whole community might be. And we also have lots of research in, into alternative management practices. Report cards, so uh, we produce these report cards every year. Uh, they're Queensland government, but federal government's involved as well. And the re we're reporting against various targets that have been set that I've been involved in for a long time to set them targets. Uh, here's a typical one from a few years ago. Uh, for pesticides, it's a bit hard to see, but if you just look at these triangles with crosses in, that's the pesticides. We'll ignore the involved nitrogen sediment for the moment. There's a target up here, that target's been changed this isn't in loads, but anyway, we were making some progress up to about here, but the last few years, this goes on like this too, we've been making very little progress, which is quite sad because as I'll say, pesticides are something we could manage. What do I think about managing fertiliser and nutrients for the GBO? Never got away. Sediment? Uh, uh, not too good there either. <laughs> Um, and so what we see is, you know, a slowing rate of progress towards the targets. The research into better application has been lots of stuff going on. The sort of things we're looking at are hooded sprayers. So instead of spraying herbicides out that will kill the cane itself, should the cane itself, you have these hoods over them. You only spray very carefully along where the weeds are. I'm not sure. Therefore, you can use a whole range of pesticides, herbicides, I mean, that would normally kill the sugar, but will not because you're not spraying it on the sugar. You can use 90% less by doing this, and you get 90% less loss as well. So it's just remarkable. Even now, there's fancy stuff going on. These are computerised weed recognition with multiple herbicides robots that run along. The camera. They can tell you whether it's a broadleaf weed or a grass. They can, they can even tell you what weed it is up to a point. So they've got recognition in them. They've got a whole range of herbicides and they spray the right one. Because some herbicides kill grasses, some broadleaf weeds, and so on. So these are magic. Of course, they're still in development, but they're happening. Um, QUT and Clean Plan Government have got this AgBot thing, runs along. Or GPS control to you know within one centimetre. Knows where it is to within one centimetre and it sprays and it spray on each foot of the right herbs. And as you can imagine this reduces use enormously. Um, so what's the future for pesticide management in the GBR? Well unfortunately it's still not good. Even though it's easier to manage, I think, in principle, than managing erosion, which is a nightmare, and nutrients and fertilizer would be a nightmare too, um, you've got all these new techniques which are coming into use a bit, but very slowly, and, but the national scale is a real problem. The, the national regulator is useless. And, even though we're doing a lot in the GBR, and keep remember we're doing lots of management in the GBR and all sorts of things, it doesn't happen in North Australia, even though they've got some of the same problems. Um, and even then, you don't know what's going on all the time. So Dairon was actually finally restricted by APBMA a few years ago. And the use has gone down a bit. But of course, farmers then use something different. Um, Metribucin was one of the alternatives to Dairon. Well, that turned out okay, except some studies I was involved in showed it was worse than Dairon environmentally. So these are tricky. You're going to ban one herbicide or insecticide, replace it with another. Um, you want to be really sure the ones you're going to replace it with, in, from the environment point of view, are better 
APVMA do not have the remit to even do that. That's not their fault. They do not have, if they ban a herbicide, for good reason, and it's the data showing it's bad, APVMA cannot do some sort of assessment, which would be hard, about the herbicides that are going to replace it, likely to replace it, and whether they're worse or better than diarrhea. So this is a bit of a problem. Um, of course, since we're able to do so much research here, we're able to pluck those things out at least and talk to farmers about what you might do better. Uh, Queensland government's got some very controversial new water quality regs for the GBR out that are still in and haven't been fully passed yet, but they don't really look at pesticides for one reason or another, mainly about sediments and nutrients. And APV, right at this moment, going through Parliament is a new streamlining regulation. You, know, you, you all know what streamlining means. That means you less protection for everything, if you like. Make it easier for farmers to, to register new pesticides, to use pesticides. That's likely to go through now with the current government, and that will make APV and they even less effective. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to put in the really big picture. We really need a radically shifted management regime um, to manage water quality in GBR. We're failing miserably at the moment, which is really sad. I've worked on this for you know. um, There is federal legislation that could be used, but there's zero chance of the current federal government using those. Um, Queensland government, oh, now I've done it. Anybody know how you turn it back on? Oh, that's easy. Um, Queensland regulations are in place, but not addressing pesticides. And of course, then we have climate change. We won't even talk about that, but I've talked about this before. We have to recognise that climate change is obviously doing things, particularly in the corals, not so much maybe to see us in the GBR. And any water quality management needs to take account of that. And and respond to that because we do not have the money to manage water quality adequately everywhere. But maybe we have enough money, we spend a hundred million dollars a year or something more. We can do it in places where it can help to make more better resilience against climate change. That's sort of being looked at, but that's pretty hard as well, you know. I mean all you people work on coral reefs and coral reefs fish mostly I guess not see us. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> um, I mean, the future's not great for coral reefs, is it? <laughs> no matter what we do about what quality. Uh, seagrass and that, which I'm more involved in, and turtles and things like that, maybe managing water quality is still a somewhat useful activity. <laughs> okay, I might finish there.